Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm George Ruder, that's Ben Allen. We are here at Zion Fellowship in Canandaigua, New York. We are a life-giving local church. On this special episode, we're going to talk about Bible literacy, what it is, and why we care about it. Well, I'm George Ruder. I'm one of the leaders here at Zion Fellowship. I've been here 22 years with my wife. We have six children, three grandchildren. Uh, most of what I do here, I get to teach from time to time, uh, Bible classes, things like that. I've worked with teenagers and young adults. Uh, that's most of what I do. Ben? Yeah, my name is Benjamin Allen. I'm 30 years old, and I went to the University at Buffalo for psychology, and I became a believer July 4, 2012, which was kind of reminiscent for me um, with, you know, no longer Independence Day, but in his Dependence Day. And so uh, I've been coming to Zion since 2018. I met my wife in uh, 18, got married in 19, had a child, Michael Athanasius Allen. He's about to be one year old. And I also teach at times and do some classes here at Zion. Uh, right now, I'm doing a Gospel of Mark class. We're about seven chapters in. Tonight's going to be chapter seven. So, yeah, that's a little bit about what I do here. So, let's first consider what is Bible literacy? How would you define Bible literacy? So, the first thing that comes to my mind, George, is, is this idea of understanding and competency when it comes to all things Bible. And so that means uh, recognizing stories, recognizing the different uh, general motifs that are inside the Bible. It means recognizing the, the intent of what the author and what who God is in trying to convey this, uh, this book that is carried over 1400 years with several different authors. And so I think that's big, you know, 10,000 foot view? I don't, what, what would you think? Yeah, yeah that, that's the big picture. Um, when, we, when we talk about literacy, we're talking about reading for understanding. Mm -hmm. And to read for understanding, we're trying to ascertain what is God trying to teach us through what his word says. Yeah. So, and that's different if you're reading the stories from the Old Testament as it is when you're reading the prophets, as it is when you're reading the letters in the New Testament. So knowing what you're reading and why it matters and what God is trying to do to teach us. Because uh, the, the thing that lots of Christians struggle with is, can I just open up the Bible and do what it says and the answer sometimes is, no, please do not just open up the Bible and do what it says. You have to know what is being taught by what has been said. And that requires some level of sophistication. Uh, not the kind of sophistication that you need to go to school to get, because the, the Bible was written to be understood by the peasants of the ages. So we're not saying that there's some sort of secret mystery but there are some, some rules in place, some principles that have held firm over the years on how we interpret the scripture and therefore what we can learn about God through them. Yeah, I think there's, there's something to be said of what observations can be made, just the who and the what, what's going on and the where, right? Understanding yeah. the context of it. And then there's this separate thing called interpretation. The why, why is, how is he doing that? And then, and then apart from those two things, there's the so what, the application, right? right? And so we can have an interpretation, but that doesn't mean that that carries over to the application, right? We have, right. To, we have to then, okay, we have interpreted this section. Does this apply to our lives whatsoever? And if it does, what does it look like when we do apply it, you know? Right, because we can read and we can, we can understand what we're reading in the same way that I can understand Lord of the Flies or Moby Dick or the Scarlet Letter, but, but then what we do with that, how we walk out those principles, is in part dependent on the context of the thing that we're reading. Yeah. Uh, so that, that stuff matters. How we, 
How we consider what God is trying to say to us in part depends on what we understand the scripture today. And I would, you know, in, in terms of being able to break this down into easy component, bite-sized understandings, we have, we have the actual words themselves, right? We have mm -hmm. rules of grammar, we have the syntax, we have, you know, the Greek or the Hebrew language, depending on which testament you're reading. Yeah. And then you have the actual cognitive environment of the biblical writer. You have, you have in Moses' time, the, the time period of the Bronze Age. You have, um, you know, the exile in Babylonia, just different types of religions, a, a religious context, a, a worldview difference of context. And then you have the New Testament, the first temple, uh, or excuse me, the second temple literature being at work here. And all these different genres uh, are shaped by this environment that they're a part of. And so sure. we have to be able to recognize that there's this cognitive environment as well as just overall grammatical rules. So why? Let's go there. Why? Uh, why does it matter? Why is it important for us to, con to, to talk about Bible literacy? Uh, why do we care so much about those things? What what effect does it have on the average person in a pew listening to a podcast, etc.? Why do we care? So I think the reason we care is because we want to make sure that we, first of all, honor God and his word. And so the two things that are breathed out right in this entire universe are human beings and scripture itself. And so we should do our best to honor what God has breathed into. And so we're honoring one another and we're honoring scripture itself. And so that's the first thing. Our values are pointing in that direction. Another thing, too, is if we want to be disciples of who Jesus calls us to be, it means following him in spirit and truth. And part of that following means to be um, zealous about what we care about. And we care about God's word. We care about Jesus written in God's word. And so when we do that, we're not doing this Bible study to get a spiritual buzz. We're doing it so that way we can honor him, love him, and love one another. Because when we honor what is in Scripture, it ends up translating as us loving God and us loving one another. Right. I mean, the Scripture does say, all Scripture is God-breathed. Theopneustos is God-breathed and is profitable for reproof, rebuke, doctrine, training, and righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The, the scripture gives us everything we need for life and godliness. But you got to go figure out what that is. Yeah. You can't just uh, put the Bible close to your heart and by diffusion or osmosis, right. you just magically mature in God. There, there has to be some process by which Holy Spirit puts the word into your heart with understanding. So, so playing, playing, uh, you know, the 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 other side. Let's say, you know, hey, George, I have my Bible. I have me, you know, the Holy Spirit. Like, wh why do I need to even, you know, read anyone else? Why do I even need to listen to anyone else? Oh, why can't I just yeah be on my own? Right, I got the Holy Spirit, right? You could. You 100% could. I think it makes the maturing process a lot slower because then there aren't voices with wisdom speaking to you. Could you? 100%. I could go to the batting cage every day and swing the bat. And little by little, slowly, I'd hit a few more balls. But if I had some people who were skilled at the, the skill who could say, you know, what you're doing here, that's good. Can I recommend you straighten out that swing? Then I'm able to hit a little bit more frequently. I'm able to put a little more behind it. I have the wisdom of others coming alongside. So I'm not a fan of the so-called Lone Ranger Christianity, where people are like, I don't need anybody. I don't, and I don't know why they speak that way. I don't need anybody to, to come alongside. I got this. I'm all right. I'm by myself. I'm good. 
You could, uh, but it's I, I think the New Testament pattern is clear that that is not what is intended for any person. We could, we shouldn't. Yeah, I'm reminded there's this section in scripture where it talks about the eunuch reading Isaiah yeah. by himself. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit translates, I think it's Philip, right? Yeah. Translates Philip, I believe, to be right there next to him, to, to help him interpret what's going on. And he's anxious for that, right? right? I think it's Acts 8, but I'm not positive on that. Yeah. And so I, to me, it just, it, it feels like it's not only a description of what, what the Bible uh, has described throughout history with God uses people to bring about his purposes, but also through his word and, and in particularly helping to understand his word, he likes to use people. And so I, I, I like to say that, especially when anyone's like being like, oh, I can just... Me, my Holy Bible, and Holy Spirit kind of thing. The, the, their own kind of makeshift own trinity, unfortunately. If I could use that uh, phrase in the wrong context here. Well, yeah. But it, you know, it's, it's something that I, that I think is oftentimes we decide for ourselves that that is the best route. Because oftentimes we don't. There's almost this, this fear at times to reach out for that time. What? Why do you think there's that fear in, in reaching out for help and understanding God's word? Well, we are Americans, so we're ruggedly individual. Mm. Uh, it's, it's hard for us to reach out for help on a variety of things. Uh, there's also a lot of people who may not want to go back to school. Uh, their experiences in school may not have been the best, and they don't want to go to a class. They, they just want to know their, they want to know God better. And if I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, the living God himself in my soul, in my spirit, why would I not just rely on that? Why do I need uh, other people around? Now, mostly when people get together in small group Bible studies, what they really want is help with, uh, it has been my experience, what they really want help with is how do I walk this out? Sure, I've got my Bible and I've got all my study Bible notes and I've got my commentaries that I found online or whatever, but how do I really walk that out? And I maintain that you can't walk out what you don't really understand. Mm -hmm. So what you really want is a group of people together with you to help you understand what the scripture says so that then you have a common understanding of what God is saying so that you can walk that out together. Uh, they, people get nervous for a lot of reasons. Uh, I am always reluctant to to want to put myself out there as maybe I'm not the best at this thing. Mm. It's a thing for there are areas of my life where I don't want to ask for help because I don't want anybody to know that I can't really do that thing as well as maybe I should or maybe I think other people think that I should. Yeah. Same for you? I think so. I mean, I, I think there's part of me that realizes that I have different responsibilities in my life right now that doesn't allow me the same sort of diligence and zeal that I can have for researching the scriptures like I want to, right? I'm a father, I'm a husband, yeah. I have my job, yeah. my work, right? And so there are people, though, that dedicate their entire lives and spending their entire lives on researching this. And I'm not telling them that they're the end-all, be-all, but I don't think that we should just cavalierly say that they're not worth our time and just, you know, we could just do it ourselves, Lone Ranger style. Yeah. Can I ask you, so, yeah. so we've been talking about how, how, how we, we, we look at scripture. How often do you read your Bible? Um, ha ha. So, so I was in a church for a long time that firmly believed that a chapter a day keeps the devil away. Uh, it's not a, a bad idea. Uh, you should read your Bible 
as often as you feel you need to connect with the heart of God. Uh, so if that's, uh, uh, what's it, the morning and evening devotions method uh, that some people use, great. If that's the, the quiet time with God that was very, very popular in the 90s, having quiet time with God, devotions in the early morning or the late evening, that's great. Different people find different times to connect with God. I would certainly not want to go too long without connecting with the heart of God in the same way that I would not want to go too long without connecting with my spouse or my kids. Uh, so generally speaking, the, the overarching wisdom says at least once a day, uh, at least five days a week, and in a way that spends substantive time. Uh, and for some people, substantive time is I can steal away for 20 minutes in the morning before the kids get up. Uh, and some people are like, I can listen uh, to, to the Bible on my, my device in my car while I'm driving and have prayer time with God while I listen to his word. Uh, there's a variety of ways to do it. But generally, I think you're shooting for daily if you can. Yeah, I, I not that you gave me a, a reciprocal question, but I'm going to answer the question too. So I, I think there, there's something to be said of, of what's going to be the most impactful for you. Yeah. Right? So can you live off of one, oh, one slice of cake a week? Yes. Or, okay, or a daily piece of bread? Yeah. So, and, and what's more substantive, right? And so I'm not prescribing per se, um, necessarily a legalistic every daily thing. Right. But I'm just imagining that what's going to be the most impactful for you, what's going to yeah. be the most in terms of retaining that sort of thing is going to be daily for at least very much up, up front when you're walking in your walk with Christ, you know, it's going to be a daily thing. It's hard to talk about this question and not put a legalism on someone. Sure. It's hard to, to answer that question in a way that doesn't heap condemnation upon somebody, which is why it's a very dicey question uh, to consider, though everybody does. Everybody considers the question. Um, I land in a, in a place that says, as often as you feel you need to, to connect with the heart of God. And lots of people watching, listening, whatever, are going to say to themselves, but I could do more. And that's always true, unless you're constantly in the scripture. It's always true that you could spend more time. Uh, but there are other realities in play where, hey, maybe... I'm able to give God this, and I don't want any person to think that God is somehow like, where the heck you been? Because I don't think God does that. I think whenever we come to the Lord, he is glad to have us. And then, then the response of our heart is, how can I be with you more, God? What are ways that I can be with you more fully? Yeah, there was, especially in the early church, at least some of the things that I've read, and they use scripture reading as a integral part of when they gathered. Yeah. And so, so few churches, I think, do that now. But it's so important to have that type of thing. I think there's a blessing associated with it. And, and I don't mean this like woo-woo kind of blessing. I just mean like hearing God's word has a certain pleasurable experience associated with it. And so when we are able to do that, there is... Uh, the ability to have a, an associating experience where we can have a a fuller, deeper understanding of who God is. Can I ask you, sure. so we asked how often we should read. Yeah. So what translation do you read? Ah, uh, for a long, long time it was New King James. Uh, the last few years it's been the NIV, the New International Version, um, mostly because I read the TNIV that has become the NIV because they redid it about 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, 
lots of nice people read the ESV. Uh, they, they do. They're nice people. Love them a lot. Uh, there are other translations out there, but those are the ones that I, I read, that I have on speed dial. So this is it, kind of an unspoken uh, thing in realizing about Bible translations, is that they are made differently, yeah. right? Yeah. And so some, like it's on a spectrum, some are very literal, wooden, word for word, trying a thing. And that's then that's a new King James. Right, that's a new King James, the NASB, yep. uh, the ESV. Uh, ESV is word for word? I it, have not studied it, it. It's so it's 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 on that side. Okay. Um, e N E T, the okay. new English translation. Yep. That's yep. on the word for word side. Yep. And then on the other side, that's the side that's that's thought for thought. So yep. it's gonna be phrase for phrase. Right. Yep. It's gonna be more kind of you know, N L T the Message and IVs on NIV. that way, sure, sure. Um, uh, CSB, I think, is uh, in there, although it might be more in the middle than, than others, but or uh, amplified would be there, sure. So, so I guess I would say, so if I want to study God's word, yeah, which translation do I use? Yes, uh, uh, so explain the what fact, you mean. So, the fact that things are on, uh, so. Some of it is a binary word for word versus thought for thought. So that part is, is somewhat binary, but it really is more of a spectrum because even though the things that are, the translations that are word for word still have to convey some thoughts and they do. And the, the folks who are thought for thought still have to translate words and they do. So I don't care what people read so long as they know what they're reading. So, and by that I mean the following. There are word-for-word -word translations like the New King James, and when you read the word-for-word -word translation, you have to know enough about the context so that you can interpret the words that are said. Okay. When you read a thought-for-thought -thought or phrase-for-phrase, then you have to recognize that somebody else is making decisions for you. Mm. Uh, so it doesn't matter what you read. It really does not. Uh, I don't land on one side or another with what's better or worse. I don't think there's a better or worse. But you have to know what you're reading. You have to know that somebody else made decisions for you or somebody else didn't make decisions for you and therefore you have to, you have to know. So um, there are instances where an author will use a euphemism and if, if you're word for word, they just translate the euphemism. They translate the words and then you have to know what was really meant by that. Uh, whereas in a phrase for phrase, they made the call for you and then you've got to know that that was done behind the scenes. So, I guess, can I, can I give my two cents? Yes. All right. So, so every, both the New Testament and the Old Testament, they have uh, what we call original languages underpinning yep. the, what we have as English translations. So, Old Testament's Hebrew, unless you're looking at the Septuagint, which is uh, Greek, the Septuagint there. is the Greek translation of the, the Hebrew Old, Old Testament. Correct. And then the New Testament is Koine Greek. Yes. Right? So I would say if you know the original languages, bless you if you do. But if you don't, you know, if you don't, I would say use multiple translations when you go to study God's Word. So when you go to study, not necessarily for devotional reading, no, no, but no. when you go to study. I would say if you're going to just read, just for the sake of reading, read the most re readable ver translation for yourself. There it is. So like, so if you want to, like, oftentimes people uh, who have English as a second language, the NLT tends to be a very good translation to to step into because sure. it's worded in such a way that helps support that, sure. right? The sure. NIV tends to be the easiest from a, I believe it's a fifth grade reading level yep. that people right. can take advantage of in terms of reading. So I guess, so I'm, I'm going to qualify. If you can read the original language, deal with those when you study. Yeah. Okay. But if you can't, if you want to study, read multiple translations. Sure. And then if you just want to read, 
Well, then just read ones that's going to be the easiest flow in terms of sure. information. And I will qualify, there is a difference between when I read just because I want to get the word inside of me. I'm just having mm. quiet time with God. I want to read some of his word. I want to pray yeah. a little bit. I want to start my day well. There's a difference between that and I really need to know what God says about a particular topic or a particular chapter. I really want to go deep. That's a study that's deeper than I just want to spend some time with God in the morning. The, those two are not the same thing. Agreed. Both of them are parts of being literate with the scripture. Yeah. Both of them are important for people, uh, but I'm not bringing my my 12 concordances and my 16 commentaries into my morning. I just want to be with Jesus time. Right. Uh, that's a different thing. Right. There's lots of different things you can do with scripture. I don't know if we have time to get into all of them, but it seems like reading is one of them. Studying is another one. Yeah. I would imagine praying and meditating is another one. Yeah. Memorizing scripture, praying scripture. Yeah. I mean, those are all things that can be done just with scripture itself. And I think, sure. I think God commends us when we do those types of things. Um, so, yeah. I'm curious, you know, just if we could kind of pivot a little bit. So we've been talking about biblical literacy a bit, right? And yep. so I'm curious now, we, we've understood like some of the ways that, that, that we can use scripture, like praying, studying, reading, right? Meditating. So I want to get to though the Sunday service. Okay. Right? So we have some churches that will emphasize experience, the, the, the worship side of things, the, the emotion side of things that yep. God pulls at our heartstrings and can use tremendously right and then we have other churches that will overemphasize biblical uh, literacy to such an extent to the point of legalism yeah can you talk how do we sandwich those together <laughs> i mean yeah. i'm asking you to yeah. make you know <laughs> you know i will take i will bring out my broadest brush and paint right like that that's crazy uh so let's Let's talk about where the Protestant tradition comes from, right? So, so uh, in the Catholic tradition, which was the only church tradition for 1,500 years, in the Catholic tradition, the church came together to talk about the Eucharist. Mm. You gathered, there Just was... So, hang on, so what is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is Sorry. the... Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm helping everyone it, at home. Too. It's the, you're fine, it's the host, it's the bread, uh, the bread and the cup that represent or become, depending on your theological bent, the body and blood of Jesus. It's a reenactment of the Last Supper. It is a remembrance of what Jesus did for us, a remembrance that Jesus gave his body and his blood for the church. That sounds very Zwinglian of you. I'm just going to pretend I know that word. So uh, the, in the Catholic tradition, you gather for that. Uh, in fact, uh, you haven't missed church if you show up before that happens. Like, you can be late, but you can't be that late because that's why we gather. I see. The Protestants from about 1500 or so, they decided we're going to emphasize the word. The word is why we gather. And that's sort of why most of your Protestant churches revolve around the pulpit in the front. Mm -hmm. That's the centerpiece of where ministry happens. Right. And yes, they sing. Uh, there, there's a worshipful time uh, and things of that nature. But really, we gather to hear the word. That's the Protestant tradition. But the last... 60 or 70 years? I go back since, to uh, Could be. Since the Pentecostal and Charismatic revivals, there's been an increased emphasis in some aspects of the church on a worshipful experience. Mm. And that's why the stage has the, where the band is going to be, because it isn't the pipe organ in the back of the church anymore, right? Like it's the, the guy on bass and the, the gal on keys and the three singers in the back and all of that. Uh, worship is supposed to be a powerful experience that intersects with our emotions. It's supposed to be, because 
I can't give all of myself to God if I don't give my emotions to God. I'm not giving all of myself if I'm not giving that. So, yes, there is something to be said for that. Uh, my take has long been, um, ha, I'll go back. About 30 years ago when I got saved, the thought was that you wanted to have an awesome worship time so that the word of God would find fertile soil when the preaching time came. So we worshiped God and it, it opened us to receive what God was going to give us in, in the teaching of the Word. That was the way things were sort of explained to me as a baby Christian in the 90s. But in reality, we preach so that we understand who God is, so that our worship is authentic, so that we know who we're worshiping. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they played that chord a certain number of times in a, in a particular key, and that's why we cry, but rather that we understand who God is and what his word has said, and we understand who we are because of what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, we can worship the we can worship God in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks worshiping yeah. God in spirit. There's a lot of folks worshiping God in truth. We want to worship God in spirit and in truth. We want to know who it is that we worship. So it sounds like you're saying it has to be both. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, when you have worship experiences, and not just worship too, but like when the spirit is moving, and, and that's a typical charismatic phrase when mm -hmm. we say the presence of, of the spirit is most pungent in in miracles people being healed of different various things in the service right those are amazing things they're miracles right yes. but you would say and i and correct me if i'm wrong but i think you would agree with this gifts establish faith but they okay. are not the mark of maturity right because every christian has gifts but not every christian is mature and so the way we bring about the maturity in christ is through his word because his word reflects his character sure and as such when the people reflect who he is the character of god will be displayed out in the world and so this is why it's i think it has to be a both and it can't be an either or Right. It, it has to be a both and, and that both and can exist both in the churches that, that have all the flashy neon lights and the, the, the fog machine and, and they sing uh, songs from a particular catalog of songs, but it can also happen just as well and just as easily in a church that sings hymns, that sings uh, choruses that are 60 years old, uh, you, can, you can have a powerful worship experience regardless of the <coughs> accoutrements because when you, when you sing from your heart to the God that you love, it has to be emotionally powerful. Yeah. It's got to be. Uh, so I don't want to put the one kind of church up against another kind of church. I don't think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, but there are certainly people who would prefer the worship end of a service to the word end of a service and vice versa. That's a preference thing. Um, my point is the one feeds the other and the other feeds the one. Amen. You need them both. Yeah, that's great. So we've talked a lot about doctrine we've been around the topic we, so we, we've doctrine been around is, the topic doctrine is you tell me okay well i just wanted to make sure we knew you know common you know definition Let's Doc, do it. doctrine i think is the teachings that what by the bible prescribes and also describes right so the question would be how do we know what sound doctrine is? The, the scripture talks about sound doctrine, how the scripture has been given so that we can have sound doctrine. How do we know that what we believe about God and what we believe about the world is actually true? So I guess I would come to, you know, we answered a part of this 
you know, earlier, why, why is biblical literacy important? It's because another answer to that is because it is a standard and rule by which we live our lives of, uh, in faith, right? Mm-hmm. And so we have our faith, and so we have to make sure it, measure, it, it, it is affirming and ascribing to a certain standard. Now, we don't have to, you know, uphold that standard because it's God's Spirit that gives us that faith, right? But so how do we make sure that when we're walking in faith with with our relationship with Jesus, how do we make sure that this is sound teaching that we're doing, that we're not going the way of, you know, uh, the Judaizers in the book of Acts or in different churches? And so I would say... That which is sound doctrine is that which affirms to the historical grammatical method of what the Bible interprets and teaches. And so the, I can I can break that the, down. The historical grammatical method of what the Bible teaches. He's going to tell you what that is. Yeah. So the historical and grammatical method is the gold standard of exegetical methodologies of interpretation. It's a lot of fancy words that I'll break them all down for you. So exegetical just means uh, the act of interpretation. Okay. Okay. Methodology is just the method. Okay. Okay. So when I say historical grammatical method, it's a particular type of interpretation that is used as the standard by which we interpret scripture. Okay. Okay. And so when we say historical in the historical grammatical method, I mean we're taking into account the historical context of the biblical writers when they wrote. The fact that the book of Acts happened in the mid first century AD. Over 30 years. What else was going on at that time? Right. Uh, The fact that the prophets lived in particular periods of time and so the history of that time as told by other books of the bible inform what's going on when we read their work all that stuff yeah so that's the historical right of that phrase so what is the grammatical method right so the grammatical just means we're obeying the grammatical syntax and grammar of the time period so okay. that, what, what does this mean? So when we say historical grammatical method, we're taking into account the historical context as well as the rules of the current grammar that's there in that context, that method of interpretation. That is the okay. gold standard of determining what is the correct interpretation. And what's the question behind that? Um, <clears throat> the way I have always understood that, what did the scripture mean to the first hearers? Yeah. Uh, when we so there's lots of people who want to skip to what does the Bible say to me? Yeah, it's and called those, reader response theory. Right. The those people skip over what did the Bible mean to them when it was first said? Yeah. Because if we know what it was meant to say to them, then we can draw conclusions for ourselves if our situations are similar. Right. And it's prescriptive, not descriptive, right? Right. There are some sections in the Bible that are just descriptive. They're describing an experience that happens. That doesn't mean that we can therefore say, oh, well, the Bible said that, therefore we can do it in our lives now here. Correct. Sometimes it's just explaining what happened back then. Other times, though, and I think you would agree with this, other times it is prescriptive. Right. We are to follow the, the exhortations right to follow to walk worthy in a manner of our calling kind of thing so yeah i think that's that's a really roundabout way of trying to get at you know what is sound doctrine it's that which upholds the historical context and grammatical rules of interpretation so if i hear you right doctrine is sound teaching is true um our interpretation is right if we can interpret the scripture from its historical context using the rules of grammar in a way that the scripture can uh, step by step build that teaching. Yes. Uh, so if I believe that something is true because of these scripture verses that have been interpreted with all the rules of grammar, then the teaching is sound. Yes. 
That's the way that I would I would I would attack that kind of question. How would how would you do it? Uh, it is it's uh, so I'm not a I, yes I follow historical and grammatical approaches yes I do um, I think sometimes teaching is sound doctrine is sound if I can put my Bible verses together in a way that says here's the argument that Paul makes from the epistles here are the words of Jesus here are Old Testament examples that back this up. Here are uh, great first century people recorded in the Bible living this way. Uh, here are warnings from the apostles about not living this way. Uh, teaching is sound if I have a panoply of scripture that speaks to it. So you would say it's like a coherence. I would hope so. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of areas of Christian doctrine that have that much scripture to build the case, right. which is why Christians disagree on doctrine at times. Uh, but I don't think you go wrong if you look for multiple scriptures to back up your belief. Uh, what does the scripture teach about what instruments should be used in worship? Precious little. We have Old Testament examples of certain instruments. None of them are a keyboard. Yeah, I don't think we're using lyres too many more. We, not a lot of lyres, very few harps. Right. Uh, they just don't exist. The tambourines, some churches use the tambourines. Some people use tambourines. I agree, <laughs> which is all fine. Right. We're not given instruction on how to do that. We're given patterns of how people right. did it, uh, but I think you'd be hard-pressed to build a doctrine on how specifically we are to worship now. There are principles in place. Right. God is worship, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, right? Like, we have scriptures that speak to principles. Those are sound. Uh, but the actual outflowing is not always clear. Right. Uh, so, for me, uh, there's... There's those things that are clearly taught in the scripture as biblical. And then there are those things where there's a little bit of play and we can be scriptural in our approach to general principles uh, without having every last little detail lived out for us. What would you say is an example of those things that is clearly like in, in the totality of the, of the Bible? What, what would you say is like clearly like this is affirmed? And then what would you say is another thing that's probably like second or third tier that says, you know, hey, uh, there's some ambiguity here. The, the gospel is an issue of, of essentialness. Uh, the, what the gospel is, who Jesus was, what he did on a cross, why that matters to me. That is taught throughout the scripture. We can stack Bible verses on top of Bible verses on top of Bible verses that say Jesus was the sinless son of God. He died on a cross for the salvation of sins. That salvation is available for all people. If we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. That's a matter where there isn't play. Um, where somebody wants to come along and say, yes, I prayed the prayer, but also have you done this other thing? No, there's no room for that. Uh, there's no scriptures that speak to, let's go for this other thing. And in fact, there are warnings about such things. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you would follow a different gospel, which is no gospel at all, right? Like you, you can go down that road. Um, but there are other things where there's play. Um, the things on the level of meat sacrifice to idols, uh, uh, which, is, which was a problem in the first century church because there were all these uh, temples to all the foreign gods. And I'm going to talk about this on Sunday, the 3rd of July. Uh, there were these, these temples to unknown gods and they would sacrifice meat on these altars and then the meat would be available in the marketplace dirt cheap and the question was 
do we or don't we buy that meat? If we buy that meat, are we, uh, are we giving credence to a false god? And then there are other people who are like, dude, it's just good cheap meat. Go buy the meat. And, and there are areas where there's play. Uh, we don't have that issue nowadays. What's something on that level for you? Yeah, so if anyone is curious, there's this awesome book called uh, uh, What Hills to Die On, A Case for Theological Triage. It's honestly the best book I read last year. It's by Gavin Orland. It's, it's really good. Anyway, okay. so in terms of like what hills to die on, first tier issues are like, the gospel, like what you said, right? Yeah. The deity of Christ, yeah. right? The Who Godhead, is. Father, Son, and Spirit, right? Those are like non-essentials, or excuse me, those they are, are they, essentials. They, those are essentials. Excuse me, <laughs> those are essentials. Yeah. Father, Son, you better edit that out, friend. Those are essentials. Oh no! It's <laughs> oh no! <laughs> it's it's the internet forever. Anyway, so so those are first tier issues, right? Those yeah. are indispensable, right? But what are some things that are second and third tier, right? So I, I have three tiers, right? And you can even okay. have four or five, right? But I would say second tier is that I can still call you a brother, but we probably won't be at the same church. Okay. Which would be, okay, are the gifts for today or not for today? Okay. Have they ceased at the apostles' time period or are they, you know, have, are they still continuing on today? And fleshing that out for our friends at home, that's... Um, is speaking in tongues still a thing? Uh, does God does God still use people prophetically nowadays? Uh, are there people with gifts of healing? Things like that. Yeah, so that would be an example of a second tier issue. I wouldn't call you a heretic or someone who, who isn't a believer for that, but right. I don't know if you would be able to have fellowship in that way at the same church every Sunday, right? Yeah. Third tier issue is things like, hmm, do I think that the rapture happens at this point, this point, or this point? All right? So, so we, can, we can argue and use scripture verses till the cows come home as proof texts. Around here they do. Right. And so we can say one over the other. We can still fellowship with one another, right? But we can agree to disagree that there's going to be some ambiguity here that we don't know for certain. Right. And the same could be said about creation. Was it... Long, short, and some people will make it a second tier issue. Yeah. Some people might make it even a first tier issue. But that's this is this is how we have to have a triage for how to deal with that. It's a really good book if anyone wants to pick it up. And I know I sound like a salesman for it, but it's a really helpful book that I found last year. There there are people who believe firmly six literal days of creation, and if you don't, you're crazy. And there are people who believe six metaphorical days, it took a long time, and really, they all use the same scripture verses to back up their view, right? Uh, which should tell them that there's probably not as rock solid agreement as they'd like there to be. Right. Uh, what makes doctrine sound is that we have multiple scriptures in the wisdom of the ages and we put it all together and and we build our lives on that. So if we find that there's not as many scriptures as we thought or I can't make all the connections I'd like to or there's lots of other people with different views, maybe... It's just a matter of conscience. Yeah. And there the scripture is very clear. Let each be convinced in his own mind. This is Romans 13 and 14. Is. Romans right? 13 and yeah. 14 tell us um, some people believe that there are special days on the calendar. Other people believe that every day is the same. Let each be convinced in his own mind. Uh, so it doesn't mean that the doctrine is or is not sound because I can have some scriptures in mind and then do something that's counter to those. I don't want to go down that road. But we want to be soft in how, how we approach others with doctrine that may not be first tier. Right. Yeah. So can, can I ask how, so we're dealing with this question of sound doctrine. How do we know, like say this is 
an essential doctrine? How do we know if we're believing something that isn't true? Like, how do we know, like, we're not being deceived spiritually? Like, are there things, are there checks that we can do, kind of tests or whatever, to kind of, like, do a checkup? Say, oh, here's my spiritual, uh, you know, is that how, how we can do it? We can uh, just go into the pastor's office and say, you know, all right, let's do a checkup. Well, it's the it's the ad that runs on the side of your social media, right? Click this link to find out if you're right. deceived, right? Like it's right. that. And then when you click it, it automatically just says, yes, in big letters, you're deceived. Um, but, well, what do we know? We know from the scripture that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Mm. Uh, and that, I mean, we're not that special. Mm. We are totally susceptible uh, there are things that I believe now that I didn't believe 20 years ago. And there are things uh, that I believe now that I may not believe 20 years from now. Uh, right. That's just part of being grown into the image and the likeness of Jesus. That's just a thing that's going to happen. Uh, in the same way that I think I know somebody really well now, but 20 years from now I know them much better. And if I'm growing toward God over the next 20 years, I should know him better. And that means some of the things I thought were true about him now are wrong. So how do we know if you're doing the Lone Ranger, live on your own, never talk to other people, it's just me and Holy Spirit, that's a little bit harder to do. That's just flat out harder to do. Right. But if I am living in a community with others and I'm meeting regularly with other people who also are trying to know God and we're comparing our views and I'm saying, well, I believe this for these reasons. And they say, really? What about that? Sometimes somebody will say, what about that? And then I got to go to my prayer closet and say, okay, God, do I have the blind spot here? Am I the one who needs correction here? Because if I'm not open to that possibility, that's an arrogance I don't want to go near. Yeah. Right? It is an arrogance to say, I've got it right. They've got it wrong. Because, I mean, that other person's also made in the image of God. and They've got Holy Spirit inside of them. So, so maybe they have wisdom that I need to learn from. It takes, huh. so I guess it takes a linear combination of humility before God and actual other people who could conceivably tell you, I don't know about that. Have you thought about this instead? What do you think it takes? Well, I think it, it, it's a combination, like you said, with making sure that there's a humility. There, there's a heart position associated with it, right? Yeah. There's also a communal aspect that's necessary, yeah. right, to being amongst the body of believers. But I think also as well, you know, we've, we've, we've been focusing on biblical literacy. So I, I think anything that can be spiritually deceiving would go against what Scripture teaches right. from the most obvious standpoint. And so that, I think, should be a placeholder in, in this discussion, especially... You know, there's no doubt that people can twist things. The devil did it when he twisted scripture, right? Sure. But that's why we have that communal component that's so important, too. Right. So we have humility, we have that communal co component, and then we have that standard, which is the scripture itself. So I think if we're using all three of those things, I think we, hopefully, God will be merciful in helping us uh, see if we are deceived. There was a, a teaching Chuck Swindoll taught in the 90s on, uh, on the cults. And his teaching was, you will never join a cult if all you're doing is reading your Bible. The majority of the cults, and, and of course that's a big broad brush, the majority of the cults require something beyond the scripture. It's the Bible and this extra thing, the Bible and this other work. Uh, but if you stick to, here is what my Bible says, then you are far less likely to be uh, in a cult of some sort. Now, nowadays there are modern personality cults where you have the scripture plus somebody's personality, which isn't necessarily an extra um, 
physical work, but it is a work of sorts. There's this book called The Kingdom of the Cults Walter by Martin. Walter Martin. Redone and, by Hank Hennegraaff. Yeah, and he, he I, I read the book in a book club. And, I'm sure you did. And we went through each one of them, and the vast majority, I don't know if you've read it, but the vast majority of them came out of the Second Great Awakening. Now, this isn't me trying to poo-poo on the Second Great Awakening. Right. But a main, and I'm, and I'm not saying there weren't great things that came out of the Second Great Awakening, i.e. Ab abolition of slavery, i.e. you know, uh, a renunciation of just secret societies and so on. Sure, sure. But you also had a high emphasis on conversionism and yeah. a lack of emphasis on discipleship. Okay. And so oftentimes what these cults will do is that they will decrease and diminish either a core doctrine of, of, uh, of, of Scripture, meaning they'll change definitions of who Christ was, right. change the emphasis on, on, on the, 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 the reality of what sin is, the fallenness of man. Yeah. They will change definitions, and they will create a sociological and psychological atmosphere that pushes you away from Scripture itself. And so... Mm -hmm. So when we're, we're talking about deceived spiritually, we're dealing with situations where at times there's a diminishment of the word of truth, right, in the Bible itself. There's a diminishment of, of asking questions. There's a diminishment of, of actual uh, definitional understandings mm -hmm. of what we understand as, as, as who Jesus is, who God is, who mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit is, who, what Scripture is, and what sin is, right? And so this is a lot of ways in which how cults came about is, is, is through a lack of discipleship. So, again, I'm just emphasizing the fact that scripture, uh, discipleship, you know, that communal aspect as well as a humility involved, you know, just to sum up those things is really important. So we're coming to a close with this. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, what advice would you have for someone that, or, or books or, um, you know, guidance for someone who's trying to say, hey, I wanted to know my Bible more and, you know, I just got saved. How can I get to a place where I feel more confident and have a better understanding of what the heck's going on in the Bible? Like, yeah. it, I, have, I don't even know where books are, right? So, yep. so, like, how do I do that? If I'm a young believer, I've just found Jesus somehow. And, and I want to know what to do next. I want to be part of a community. I want to, I want to find a good, solid local church. Uh, you can contact our church office. We'll point you towards something in your area if you're not in our area. Uh, but I want to be a part of a community of people. And so I want to ask those people, what do you use? Right? Like, cause, because big picture, if I'm going to walk this out with a group of people, I kind of want to be doing the stuff that they're doing. Right. So, so that would be my first piece of advice. Are you in with a group of people and what are they reading? What are they using so that your experience can be common together? Mm. If you're just randomly out there, what do I do? Like what are the general principles? You want to find a translation of the Bible that's readable to you. Um, the New King James may be, the NIV may be, the ESV could be, the, the NLT could be. Uh, some translation of the Bible, they're all available at BibleGateway.org. Come. Come. Uh, they're all available at BibleGateway.com or, or, or the Version Bible app or you name it. There's a, the Blue Letter Bible app. They're all available. Uh, so you just pick one that's readable for you uh, and you just start reading. When you're ready for commentaries, uh, I read uh, Tom Constable's commentary at soniclight.org. It's freely downloadable. Uh, it's a little heady. It's a little heady. If you're not uh, familiar with a lot of theological terms, it's heady. So you got to be aware of that. Uh, Matthew Henry's commentary, which is hundreds of years old, is a great read. right? Uh, that's hundreds of years old by now, right? Sure enough. Like, that's, that's old. Yeah. 
Matthew Henry is very dead, uh, but his commentary is very yeah, he's nice. He's alive in heaven right he now. He is alive. It's, it just theologically speaking, he's alive. I understand that, but his body is very dead. Um, yes, that, that's never. That is never not going to be in a blooper reel. Um, Matthew Henry's commentary is a fine place to, to begin. It's classic, and I believe also freely available in many places. Uh, I encourage young Christians to journal. Mm. Uh, I read a chapter of the Bible. I have no idea what it says. I write down all the things I don't understand about what it says, and I write down to God, oh God, help me understand what this says. Mm. Uh, what are my thoughts about what I'm reading as I'm going? Uh, if you've been around for a while and you've been studying the scripture a little bit, uh, most Bible students have a concordance somewhere, many of them freely available online. Uh, Strong's concordance is the gold standard. There are others uh, that help you connect the words you're reading to other places where those words are used. It's what a concordance does. Uh, some people read, uh, nobody really reads a Bible dictionary. I'm not even going to pretend that that's true. But they have Bible, di nobody reads a Bible dictionary. I have like nobody does. They don't read them. Uh, you, you've got Bible dictionaries. That, you, you reference them. You don't read them. It's not a comic book. Uh, but so resources like that on hand can be helpful. Um, I found it's helpful to read How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Fee and Stewart. Uh, that's a little heady because uh, it's meant for seminary students, but it's available to anybody with a high school reading level kind of a thing. Yeah. You can read it. Yeah. It is readable. Um, those are my thoughts on the matter. What do you have? So I would say... You can get the various different translations on the internet. Sure. So, so start out with that. They have that on computers now. Would you believe? Yeah, I believe it. Okay. Um, and then, so there's, there. I would say there are a couple things, right? So after you have a couple translations, after you've read through the Bible a couple times, I would say get yourself a study Bible. I like the Cultural Backgrounds Study Bible. You can have it in NKJV, NIV, or... ESV, I believe, or okay. the Archaeology a Study Bible. Those two are pretty good. You have to dig that up somewhere? Yes, actually, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and then once we get a Study Bible, you have... Uh, now, what's, what's the advantage of a study? What makes a Bible a Study Bible instead of just a Bible? So a Study Bible is basically like having someone at your side that puts little notes at the bottom of your Bible and... And even has sometimes really cool illustrations about the historical context about what's going on in the section. So it might talk about um, chaos imagery in the Old Testament. It might okay. talk about, you know, the responsibilities of the priests back then. It might have a, a model or a picture of how the temple looked back then, right? So various different things. So study Bible, right? Multiple translations. You can have a Bible dictionary as a reference work. And you can as a reference work that nobody actually reads, like starting on page one. They don't, but they reference it sometimes when they need it. It's like a dictionary like we have. No one reads the dictionary from cover to cover that many times. Really? We're going to get comments on this that say, I read the dictionary cover to cover. And I'm sure they are telling the truth. I believe it. So, so there... There is uh, various different Bible dictionaries, I would say. The best one that I found for beginner is called the Lexham Bible uh, Dictionary. This is by Lexham Press. They actually host um, a software called Logos Software, Bible yeah. Software. Yeah. But this dic Bible dictionary is free. You can get it for free on their website. Um, as well as, so we, we dealt with study Bibles, dictionaries. There's also... Uh, dictionary of IVP Press. That it's yeah. a dictionary. That's like super heady. Yeah. If you want to go real super deep, that's something you can invest in over time. Well, that's IVP a, is for college students, right? right? Like right. IVP InterVarsity is a right. Christian fellowship of college students. So, so, so they're talking to people yeah, in colleges. Dictionaries, study Bibles, and then I would say you have commentaries now. You use kind of the the the, the stuff already available online. I think. Um, there's 
there's some that are available online. I think if you wanted to invest, you could, um, there's a pillar uh, translation um, commentary series that's pretty um, bite uh, chewable for the new believer that if they wanted to get into it, they could. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to go really heady, they can get the new international commentary of the Older New Testament. That's okay. super duper heavy uh, okay. in, in terms of commentaries. There's the Tyndale commentary series that's, yep. that's pretty available for people. There's also the super duper people uh, that really heady is the word biblical commentary. For anyone who knows original languages, they can get into that one. Okay. Um, and if they they really feel like they want to go super deep in the Bible, they can get software for that. There's sure. Olive sure. Tree, there's uh, Logos Bible Software, there's uh, a free resource with uh, Blue Letter Bible, yep. although that, that is limited to some extent. But, uh, you know, so those are some things I would say from a podcast perspective, because I'm from a different generation than you are, George, as surprisingly as that sounds. Whipper snapper. Yeah, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, b the Bible Project is a great um, is a great uh, organization that gives free illustrated videos. Yeah. Uh, every book of the Bible, they have a podcast yeah. available. Yeah. I know some people that I've talked to here that go to this church that they do the Bible Project. I love them. I love the Naked Bible Project with Dr. Heiser. Um, it's really, really, uh, there's there's a whole like litany of that thing. So if you guys want to, you can leave some comments and we we'll, can try to answer them. If you do want to ask a question, we'll try to answer the best of our knowledge. But any other things ben, you want to? Ben promises to answer every comment that pops up below our, our faces. And he by promises. Ben, we mean anyone. That's probably true. Uh, I'll say that when I was a baby Christian in the 90s, um, on the radio, and you'll have to ask your parents about what a radio was. On the radio, I got a, I got to listen to a lot of J. Vernon McGee's Through the Bible, uh, which and, and his commentary that covers all of all sixty six books of the Bible. He would just read basically his commentary I on see. the radio in twenty minute chunks. Wow. Um, not sure if that's available now or what this generation's equivalent of that would be because J. Vernon McGee is also very dead. So so there's got to be somebody alive, doing okay. that. Alive in a different place. Alive in a way that I can't talk to him. Alive in a way that is somewhere Wait, else. Wait, if he's alive, why can't you talk to him? Because he isn't on earth in an alive body. <laughs> and... But there has to be some version of that for this generation, uh, and I just don't know who that is. It's the Bible Project. Is it the Bible Project? Is yes. that what they're doing nowadays? Uh, I mean, I would just say it was very helpful to it's me. It's my generation's thing, I think. I agree. It was, it was very helpful for me to have somebody who would just, while I was driving somewhere, just talk about the Bible verse by verse. And when the time ran out, he was like, well, we'll pick this up. We'll pick this up next time when we gather, right? Like it was just a thing that he did. Um, who's doing that nowadays? It's probably some podcast, some project, some something. There are very rare instances where I would say, that person's reading the Bible and talking about it? Don't go anywhere near that. Uh, it's, it's very hard to imagine somebody going through all 66 books of the Bible in some systemic way uh, where you won't learn something. Got to be my view. Cool. Well, thank you guys for, for joining us. And, you know, if we decide to have more of these, um, hopefully you'll come along and join us. So thanks for listening, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.